Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Granite Springs Church. It's so good to be together to worship this morning. As we do, let's rise and sing together. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm 145. The Lord is righteous in all his works and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Friends, let's remember the good news of baptism by having this conversation. Your part is in white. In baptism, God extends love and hope in Jesus. In baptism, God calls us his people. In baptism, God welcomes us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Friends, the prophet Habakkuk shows us a faith that, well, it isn't afraid to question God, but also it is ultimately comfortable resting in a God who is faithful to us. This is in the midst of visions of the rising and falling of empires, in the midst of chaos. Have you seen, witnessed, felt any chaos lately in your own life, in our world? We need this same kind of trust. A trust, a faith in God that can both question and wonder and also rests in his goodness to us. And so we're going to pray that we might be those kinds of people using these words from Psalm 145. When I pray the Lord is trustworthy in all he promises, would you respond and faithful in all he does? Let's pray. Faithful God, thank you that we can join with the psalmist and remind one another. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises. We confess that in the midst of hard times, it is so easy for us to forget that you are at work. When the ground feels like it is crumbling under our feet, if we think of you, we think of you in terms of what we want you to act, where we want you to act, when we want you to act, and how we want you to act. In a complicated world with what so often feels like an endless roller coaster of ups and downs, we confess that we feel out of control, and so often we are scared. We need your help, God. We need the promise of your care. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises. Thank you that even when our world crumbles, you give us a place to stand. You are our place to stand. Because of Jesus, you are our strength and Savior, rescuing us from our brokenness and hopelessness. Help us trust you so that even in the midst of the darkest valley, our hearts may be at rest, for you are with us. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises. In a violent world, by your Spirit, help us be people who offer your peace. In a chaotic world, by your Spirit, help us be people who embody your steady faithfulness. In a, dis in a despairing world, by your Spirit, help us be people who proclaim and live your hope. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises. As we bring our work to our worship, and as our worship sends us into our work, this week we pray for those working in insurance who help provide the possibility of financial restoration in the midst of tragedy. We pray for just practices, for access for all who need this help, and that this work and the people working in this field would reflect your grace and care for all people. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises. Amen.
let's rise and continue to worship together. Friends, God extends his peace to us and invites us to pass it to one another. You can do this so easily by simply turning to your neighbor and saying, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let's pass the peace, friends. Well, friends, you may have a seat unless you're in kindergarten through fifth grade or sixth, seventh or eighth grade. You may make your way to Marissa and Zach there in the back before Marissa walks out. This week we had our music camp, which Marissa coordinated and Jana and her culture house team helped do music and all kinds of things. And it was a success. You're not shocked. Let's clap and thank them. Really, I was here for their Friday performance, and I thought, they learned all of that within one week. There were streamers, and there were ukuleles, and there were dance moves, and there was singing. And I thought, you lost me at streamers, but they were amazing. So thank you for all their hard work to that team and to the kids as well. Well, we have a number of announcements. The first is, if you're joining us for the first time this morning, well, that's deceptive. That's not the first, that's not the first announcement. 
But the first announcement is we are so glad you're here. There's this Connect card in your worship guide. We'd love to get to know you. And this is just one way to do that. You can fill it out and drop it in the offering or at the welcome desk, which is right out those double doors across the way. There's even, I think, I know, actually, I don't think, I know. There's a free book if you turn in your Connect card. Now, our, first, our next announcement, second announcement, third announcement, I don't even know what we're on. But next Sunday, a pilgrimage with St. Paul Info Meeting. If you're interested in taking a trip with Pastor Kevin and Jerry, uh, following in the footsteps of St. Paul. So St. Paul won't literally be there, uh, but you will be with Kevin and Jerry and getting to see some of the places in Turkey and Greece. And I believe there's even a couple days on a cruise ship as you go to Patmos and Crete, I think. Uh, you can learn more about that next Sunday after the second service. Maybe you have a friend who you think might be interested. That's a great chance to learn more next Sunday. You can sign up online for that meeting, or you could even just show up, I'm sure, and you'd be welcome. And then today, our next announcement is that today and next Sunday are what we're calling Directory Sundays. So some of you have already connected and gotten onto our new online directory. <laughs> Clap for you. Oh, well, you can join me. I'm just clapping. Uh, some of you maybe tried and thought this is overwhelming and stopped. You know what? We clap for you. Effort. That's good. And some of you thought, I'll wait till Sunday and see if someone can help me. You know what? Clap for you too, because here you are. Uh, we are here. Me and some of the deacons are out there to help you. If you, have a, if you need a photo taken or you have a question about how the whole thing works and how, you're, how in the world you're supposed to access this newfangled online directory, we're there to help you. The beauty of moving to the 21st century is, of course, our directory will never be out of date again. It's a miracle of modern technology, but it's really, trust me, convenient once you know how to get on it and we're there to help as well. So that's today and next Sunday as well. And then finally, I told you last week, I think, that Pastor Kevin would be back today. He's not here. I mean, he's in the country, so he's getting closer and closer, but unfortunately he's sick. And so he's home today. So we said, the people are sick of just Matt. Can we please bring in someone for the people? And so we are so glad we flew in Q from Kansas. Actually, technically the Army flew him in, but we're glad that Q is here. And Dory, his wife, this is the first time we've gotten to say this with you in person. So why don't you both stand up and give a little wave? You're not going to get away with just sitting there. <laughs> Q, uh, Q served here in ministry for about nine years and then uh, thought, I need to go find a wife. And so he joined the Army <laughs> and was successful. No, I don't think that's why. Uh, but he's been serving in active duty army chaplaincy for the last three years. But we're very excited. They've been here this week looking for housing because they are moving back. And Q will be coming back on staff here in October. And Dory, of course, is coming with him, which we are really delighted about. Maybe more delighted about even, dare I say. So welcome to both of you here. Q is going to be preaching on Habakkuk for us in just a moment. Well, friends, let's pray before we receive our offering. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we worship, remember our baptism, hear your word, and come together to your table. Thank you that in all these ways, you remind us that you are with us. You are a God who wants to be with us. You are with us in weeks that are wonderful and full of good things, and you are with us in the midst of weeks where chaos seems to reign. We pray that this morning you would help us receive and believe your promise to be with us more deeply. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Yeah, it was a challenging mission indeed, but I did come back with the wife, so it worked. Thank you, thank you all for praying, or I know that my mother was praying, so I know that at least one person was praying and rooting for me. Um, but I was actually in active duty Army uh, world as a chaplain for the past three years, and so glad to be here. And every time I visit it, maybe a couple of times, so once a year, y'all always make me feel special. But it's not going to work because I have a mother and now a wife who reminds me that I'm not all that special. So <laughs> nice try. Um, but I am really, um, I know that I don't know all of you, y'all don't know me, so as we settle um, mid-September and as we start, uh, you know, attending the church and serving the church in October, I'm really looking forward to getting to know um, you all. So uh, thank you again for the kind welcome, and uh, let's pray together. Gracious God, um, we come before you this morning remembering that you are a God who gathers your people. You are a God who is faithful through changing circumstances and challenges of life. I pray especially for those of us here today who may have no strength to give you anything in their lives. Uh, especially for those of us who may feel like you are not near us, that we can't sense or experience your faithfulness to us. God, would you near yourself as we share your word and as we commune with each other, as we continue to worship this morning, would you help us to see you a little more clearly and help us to deepen our faith a little more today, baby step at a time. We trust in your guidance. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Uh, Ted Turner, an American entrepreneur and television producer, once in an interview said, Christianity is a religion for losers. And ironically, he grew up in the church, you know, going to church most of his early life. And in fact, when he was younger, he wanted to become a missionary. That was his goal, and that's what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. And yet, his faith was lost, as he would say, as he watched his little sister Mary Jean suffer from this rare form of lupus. And he recalls hearing her scream through the walls in excruciating pain, his parents not knowing how to help, feeling helpless all around the household. It's really not a pleasant experience by any means. And they prayed, they leaned on God, they trusted God, that there will be healing, but after some time, after five years of long-fought battle due to its complications, Mary Jean passed away. And Ted Turner, Turner would say that it was then that his faith was shaken and that his faith was lost. You know, when terrible things happen and when hard times get even harder, our faith can be tired or it can get shaken or even torn sometimes. Uh, about a year ago, um, you know, I've been, again, doing the chaplaincy in the Army world, and a huge part of my job involves pastoral counseling. And a soldier was sitting in my room, and he opened the conversation with a question asking, is God real? And if God is real, how could I have experienced such pain in my life? And how could those things have happened to me if God is indeed good and holy and faithful. How could that happen? And he went on to share his life story. And it turns out when he was 13 years old, his mom had a boyfriend who was nice and very cordial in the beginning. And soon after, he moved into their place and their lives started to mesh more. And then he started to abuse him physically and verbally and mentally. Basically, the message that he got from him on a day to day basis was that he will amount to nothing. And he was a Christian person who went to church. How could that happen when God is indeed good and holy and faithful? When terrible things happen all around us and when our hard times get even harder, friends, our faith can get tired, it can get shaken, or sometimes we can even lose faith. We've seen that or heard that around us, haven't we? So this morning... The question that I would like to pose with the time that we have leaning on the book of Habakkuk is, what if faith can actually 
help us to not only survive, but flourish through our hard and harder times of life. Is that possible? And with that, let's turn to the book of Habakkuk as we continue our series on the book of Minor Prophets. One thing that's really noteworthy about this book is that this is the only book in the whole, you know, this series of the book of Minor Prophets where nothing is really directly addressed to the audience. So God's word come as a words of prophecies, but nothing is really addressed directly to the Israelites and therefore to us who are reading this book. It is really entirely from chapter 1 to 3, entirely a dialogue between God and Habakkuk. Really a heartfelt, honest conversation between God and Habakkuk. And as we overhear this conversation, my hope and prayer is that we'd be able to learn uh, a couple of things about what faith looks like and how faith can actually help us to not only survive, but flourish through our hard times. So with that, let's um, look at our selected passage, which is chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, and it goes like this. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So two things that I'd like to pull from this text and share with um, y'all this morning. And the first thing about faith goes like this. When terrible things happen and hard times become even harder, faith gives voice to the deepest cries of our hearts. Faith gives voice to the deepest cries of our hearts. All that we can find in our hearts, faith allows us to express and share those things with God. Uh, Look at chapter or verse 17. When Habakkuk is talking about the fig tree Uh, grapes. Basically, he's referring to the land of Israel. There will be no produce. There will be no life. So the context of this is they were in a really rough situation where the religious leaders of the time who were given the responsibility to lead the people of Israel in the ways of God were corrupted. And as a result, people were suffering. There was great violence and injustice all around. And especially the poorer and the weaker people of the society were suffering because of it where God had really, really had this heart and and command to take care of, especially the poor and the weaker people. And on top of that, the world power at the time, Babylonians were maybe a step or two away from invading Israel. So the terrible things were going around already, and now with Babylonians, the threat that's coming from the Babylonians, the things are about to get worse before it gets any better. So in this context is where we also find verse 18. Verse 18, Habakkuk says, Yet, however, I will, be, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. And when we look at verse 18, I don't know about you, but first few times I was reading it, this was a spiritual goal and spiritual aspiration right here. This is the faith that I would like to reach at some point in my faith walk or journey of faith. It is a faith, the kind of faith that is unmovable, it is unshakable, it is unwavering, whatever the circumstances of life. And now that is partially true. That is part of what one's faith can look like. However, that's not the entirety of it. And I think we're missing the mark or misunderstanding the intent of the book of Habakkuk if if we were to just take verse 18 and say, no matter what the situation of our life, If we don't look like this, surely we're doing something wrong. Because I say that if we were to go back to chapter 1, and you can just listen, verse 2 is, this is how Habakkuk opens his prayer, his dialogue with God. Listen to the language. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? 
destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. This is a person of faith who is sharing his personal struggle from his heart to God. It's a biblical concept called lament. As soon as we hear how long, we get the alarm saying that this is lamentations. The same language that we find in the book of Psalms, in the book of Lamentations, he is sharing his personal struggle. And the key about lament is it's sharing your sorrow, grief, disappointments, frustrations, and even anger to God. The key is to God and with God. Because if we are sharing all these things with everybody else but God, that is not lament. That is perhaps gossiping about God. But lament is we see Habakkuk honestly tuning into what he finds in his own heart and expressing the deepest cries of his heart to God. And what this tells us about this book is that God not only listens to the deepest cries of our hearts and makes room for that in our faith walk, but he honors them. But however, the challenge is here. If you're like me, many of us may find this to be a difficult concept or reality. Uh, I've been serving at a church on military base and we have elders there. And one of the elders, maybe about a month ago or a little over a month ago, um, came up during the announcement time and shared a testimony. She had sort of this chronic illness that she's been dealing with for lengthy period of time, and then she was happily sharing with the congregation that her recent visit to the doctor was very promising, and she's making a lot of progress, and the, um, the pain has really subdued, and all these wonderful reports. And just about a couple weeks later, we also, in that service, or after the service, or after the sermon time, really, uh, all the chaplains come up to the front, and people who need prayers would come up to receive prayer. And that same elder came up to where I was standing, and she immediately started tearing up. And she was talking about how her pain came back, and it's you know, even worse than before. And she's tearing up as she's sharing this. But what was so evident and clear from that conversation was that what was most painful for her wasn't really the physical pain, but the heaviness in her heart and even guilt about holding confusion or doubts or questions or anger or frustration or disappointment toward God saying, why me? Why is this happening? Why aren't you making it better? She held so much guilt in her heart because of that. And that is the challenge, isn't it, in our faith walk? Maybe you as well, at times in your life, feel like if your faith is not unwavering or unshakable, you feel like you're not faithful. But what does this tell us about our faith? It tells us that if you are going through hard times in your life currently, and you feel like because of the sorrow and anger and disappointments or frustrations or even anger that you have toward life or God, and you feel like you're faithless, that that is not the case. That sometimes in our lives, that is all we can offer. That is an act of faith. That is an act of worship, really, to bring those things to God and enter into a relationship like that. You see, Paul Miller is a Christian author, and he has held a seminar where Christians uh, from all around the states uh, joined that seminar, and the way he opened the seminar went this way. He put words up on the slideshow and basically said it was a prayer, and he told the audience that, hey, this is a prayer that I found from an edgy Christian book. Would you all offer some critiques about it? And the words go like this. God, are you avoiding me? Where are you when I need you? Long enough, God. You've ignored me long enough. I've looked at the back of your head long enough. Get up, God. Are you going to sleep all day? Wake up. Don't you care what happens to us? 
Why do you bury your face in the pillow? Why pretend things are just fine with us? And here we are, flat on our faces in the dirt, held down with the boot on our necks. Get up and come to our rescue. If you love us so much, help us. And people started sharing their critiques, saying, that's disrespectful. I mean, how could you pray this way? This is inappropriate. And Paul Miller calmly replied to them, saying that these are actually words from Psalm 10, Psalm 13, and Psalm 44 in the message translation that Eugene Peterson put together. What this tells us about who God is, is that God desires to have an intimate relationship with each of us. He longs to meet us in the place of depth. He longs to hear from our hearts in honest and raw ways. And if you're like me, when I was growing up, I didn't have room for anger or even sadness, I think, in our household. And there's complex reasons behind that, that I can't share everything here. But I didn't have room for anger or sadness, and that translated directly to my relationship with God most of my young, young adulthood. And it's still a challenging thing to be truthful and honest with the anger or frustrations that I feel about life or even about God and his ways that I cannot understand. But what we learn from this text is that God longs us to enter into a deep intimacy with each of us. That nothing that we share, however we show up, he will not be scared of us. That he can handle them just fine. And so the invitation is to look into your hearts, tune into your hearts, and be honest with God. And may you all experience his love and his kindness, his mercy, his grace to you. He's amazing. Uh, the second thing, the first thing is faith. When hard times get even harder, faith gives voice to the deepest cries of our hearts. Second thing about faith, how it, how it looks like, goes like this. When terrible things happen, hard times get even harder, faith raises our minds to a higher plane of seeing. And that is really, faith helps us to see God in all circumstances of, a lot of our lives, and especially hard and harder times of our lives. It's really his grace. Uh, let's go back to verse 18. He says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. This is where we find, the, this is a subject of Habakkuk's faith. And there are two lines, right, for verse 18. And Habakkuk gives us two titles for God. The first line goes, I will exalt, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will keep trusting the Lord. In its original language, the Lord basically points to the God who is inexplicable in his nature, meaning this is a God that we cannot fully understand, that we cannot put into the boxes that we have in our lives. He's inexplicable in his nature. Second line, he goes, I will be joyful in God my Savior. And basically the Savior refers to the God who rescues his people, has rescued his people of Israel throughout their history this is a God who rescues his people from physical oppression, physical circumstances, and even spiritual rescue there is implied. So if we put this together, what Habakkuk is saying is, this is the God whom I trust. It's the God who saves. I know he saves, but I don't know how or when he will save. This God saves, but I don't know when or how he saves. And we get to live in that gap. That's what faith looks like. When we don't fully understand his ways, and yet we trust that he will. Isn't this a challenging gap to live in or from? But what Habakkuk is, well, to add on to that, Habakkuk had expressed, as I mentioned earlier already, He's shared his personal struggle about all the violence and injustice that are happening in 
um, Israel and the Babylonians are about to invade them. And God actually tells him towards the end of uh, chapter 1 that, in fact, they will invade Israel and that he will use them to make all things right in Israel. And that, this was a problem and challenge for Habakkuk because Habakkuk is replying then back to God saying, how could you do this? Because Babylonians are evil people and wrongdoers before your eyes. You are a good and holy and faithful God, but how can you do such a thing and allow such a thing? And to which God replies in chapter 2 that there will be an appointed time, my time where I make all things right, and I will hold Babylonians accountable, wrongdoers accountable. That is my promise, but there will be that time. So wait patiently. And live by faith is what God says. So what we hear from Habakkuk is that I do not fully understand, but I keep trusting God. It's a mark of deep faith. But how is that possible? How is he able to keep trusting him when he doesn't know all the things or doesn't understand all of his ways? Verse 19, it's because the sovereign Lord is my strength, he says. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. This is the reason Habakkuk is able to keep trusting God. It's because he has met a God who is his strength. The end of verse 19, he enables me, this God enables me to tread on the heights. He enables me to walk on the high places. Again, in its original language, the heights, high places first refers to Israel's terrain was really rocky and tough. It's hard to climb. It signifies difficult path of life. In the spiritual sense for Israelites, high places almost always throughout the entire Bible symbolizes closeness and communion with God. So Habakkuk says, this is a God when I don't have all the answers or quick fixes or a clear sense of solution to the terrible things that's happened and the harder time, where hard times becoming even harder, but this is a God who may not offer all the explanation, but he always offers himself to us. A God who offers his entire self to us and meets us as we tread on the heights of life the rocky terrains of life. And you know what? It's truly a miraculous thing when you see someone who's evidently going through hard or harder times of life and yet is communing in closeness and intimacy with God. The miraculous thing is that oftentimes God becomes enough for these people. Still, The pain of life, the sorrows of life, the grief of life, disappointments, frustrations, all these things are true experiences of life for them. Being faithful doesn't mean that all those things are all of a sudden gone or fixed or... Those are all still true experiences of life, but when they do commune with this God, oftentimes you see these people, or or for these people, God being just enough all that they were looking for. It's really a miraculous thing. David O'Brien was born with cerebral palsy, or is it cerebral? Is it cerebral palsy? And he was born with that, with severe disability, and he started a ministry called Triad Ministry, which is basically sharing the good news, the grace, the love of God with people with severe disabilities. And he lived his life, entire life, you know, putting himself and pouring everything into this ministry and sharing the love and grace of God. And he passed away at the age of 89. And this is what one of his best friends says about David. He says, God used his cerebral palsy to draw him to depend on Christ. Was he better off with his disability? He was convinced that he was. He believed that his 89 years of difficulty and sometimes considerable suffering were no cosmic accident or satanic victory, 
but a severe mercy from the good hands of God. I mean, does that make sense to you logically? How could someone who was born into such condition through his life and at the end of his life say that what he's experienced was the mercy and the hands of God in his life someone who has communed with God closely and intimately through the hard and harder times of life, it's a miraculous thing. Uh, one of my friends, James, uh, his dad was diagnosed with colon cancer a, little, a month and a half ago, and we were praying together about the situation, and he's had a major surgery which went really well, and the last report that I had heard from him was that his dad started chemo and, you know, the recovery is going really well. And yet, about two weeks ago, um, I got a text from James early in the morning saying that his dad passed away in the middle of the night. And he shared a great sense of grief. And it was truly a challenging time for him and all of his family and yet, as I touched base with him and reconnected with him throughout the weeks, um, he began to share the ways in which this God in Habakkuk offered himself to James and his family in closeness and in communion with them. One of the ways in which he shared that observation was he quickly realized how expensive, on top of the sorrow and the grief that the family is going through, the logistically that it's a nightmare and that it's so expensive to do the burial, funeral, and all of these type of things. And the church that his mom was a part of had an elder in the past who had basically donated 10 burial arran arrangements. And James was sharing how stressed he was and anxious he was and nervous he was because he's an only child and it's just his mom left and you know, James is married and has a kid. But then the church called his mom up and said, hey, we would like to offer one of these arrangements to your family. And that was a way in which James was assured of the fact that in the midst of my sorrow and grief and frustrations and disappointments of life, here is a God who communes with me and my family. And a couple of days have passed and his mom had to now sell the house because it was already too big of a house for the two people to live and they were actually about to move into a senior mobile home community, but they backed out. And when they had backed out, dad passed away in the middle of the night. And there was a compli or complexities around that because now she needed a co-signer because she's not working. And James was trying to co-sign, which he can't because he's not a senior. So they were kind of caught in the middle and stuck and didn't know what to do. And out of the blue, one of the, friend, uh, the family friends reached out to them and asked about the situation, and they agreed to not only co-sign, but, but pay for the place so that James's family, once they sell the house, can repay them. I mean, it's a miraculous thing. And in the midst of his sorrow, as I'm talking with James, would you believe if we shared a deep sense of joy and awe, really, and awe, about who this God is, doesn't take away his sorrow. He continues to grieve and will continue to grieve. But there was a man who saw this God because his faith raised his mind to a higher plane of seeing. And when he saw this God at work in his life, God was enough. It's a miraculous thing. He was filled with an awe and praise and thanksgiving for him. So was David O'Brien. Have you seen people like this around you? I certainly have. It's a miraculous thing. Faith not only gives voice to the deepest cries of our hearts, but faith raises our minds so that we can see God in the midst of our pain. And when we do see him, he is a God who is enough. Praise God. Because he knows, one thing that tells us about who God is then, he knows what we need in the deepest places of our hearts, and that is himself. So to sum all of that up, what I've learned from this text 
is the fact that faith is a journey. It will look messy. There is no formula or perfect way to go about it. But why this can work, why this is hopeful for any of us and all of us, is because faith is ultimately not about us. Throughout this journey, we learn through the ups and downs of life that God is faithful. It's really about his faithfulness. He is unmoved. He is unshaken. He is unwavering. It's okay if we are. That's why we gather, lean on each other, ask for prayers, and limp through the way. Sometimes when we all, all we can offer is sorrow or grief, that's an act of worship, an act of faith. Let me share some words from a Christian songwriter and Christian, really, a poet. This is how he explains what our faith looks like. And I think when I came across it, I thought, oh, wow, like this really captures our conversation this morning. Andy Squire says this, Someone told us, told us that with the right kind of faith, we could have better access to health and wealth and stability. Someone told us that having a properly aligned relationship with God would make the money come and the cancer go. We went to the conference. We bought the book. We never expected that we would ever have to live with this many unanswered prayers. We were shocked. We were disappointed. But we found out that disappointment couldn't kill us. We found out that telling the truth about life would not separate us from God. We pivoted, not away from God, but further into him still. So from our pulpits and from our praises, we faced the truth. We embraced our actual lives. We entered into the promised land of God. We received whatever he allowed, emboldened by sufficient grace. I would rather trust God for everything and get nothing in return sooner than put my life into my own hands. God, I want to give you something. Trust is all I have. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are grateful for the trust that you have with one another. And we are so grateful this morning for your faithfulness to this world and to us. You are a God who is unmovable, unshakable, unwavering. And you walk with us and commune with us as we walk on the high places of our lives, tough terrains of our lives. When terrible things happen and when hard times get even harder, would you help us to express all that we find in our hearts? And would you remove, if, there are any, if there's anything in our hearts or lives that stops us from showing up honestly before you, would you remove all those things so that we can show up as however we are and whoever we are and help us also to see you walking with us and communing with us so that you may become more and more just enough for our souls as we continue to experience all kinds of circumstances of life. May your Holy Spirit make it all an adventure for us. In the name of Jesus, amen.
friends, I invite you to stand for communion or Eucharist, as we sometimes call it. Eucharist is a word which just means to give thanks. Because here at this table, we give thanks that God, he's not a God who stands afar and sort of says, trust me, just trust me. He is, in fact, as we remember here at this table, the God who comes as Jesus, who takes hard times on himself so that he knows our sorrow and our struggle and then invites us and tells us we can trust him. To come forward in a moment, as we'll invite you, is to come forward in faith. Maybe it's with a limp. Maybe it's with a skip. Maybe it's with hardly anything at all, but to simply receive God's grace for you. We'll invite you to do that in just a moment. If you don't wish to participate for any reason this morning, we still would love to invite you to come through the line. If you just cross your arms like this, then we'll know to give you a blessing. But to participate, just cup your hands like this. Someone will give you a piece of bread. You can dip it in the cup. And we invite you to respond. Thanks be to God. On our way, let's have this conversation. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, it is right to give you our thanks and praise. For you are the God who made the heavens and the earth. You created us in your image. And when our ancient parents, Adam and Eve, sinned and turned away from you, it is right to give you our thanks and praise. For you did not turn your back on them. But instead, you are a God who is faithful, who is faithful to your promises and faithful to your people, even in our unfaithfulness. And we thank you that ultimately you sent Jesus, your son, who shows us your faithfulness through his life, death, and resurrection, and shares the generosity of resurrection life and the presence of your spirit with us as we wait for the day when all things will be made new and right. So this morning, we join our voices with all of creation, with the angels and with Christians all over the world to proclaim your good and holy name. Amen. Let's pray these words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And therefore, let us keep the feast. Scripture tells us that on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, send your spirit so that this ordinary bread and this ordinary cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, nourishing our soul. Through this meal, may we and all your people be united with Jesus and with one another, 
as we give thanks for your never-ending generosity and grace that's made tangible here for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, however you come, whether it's with a limp or a faltering step, God welcomes you to his table and invites you to receive his grace. Come. if we're being honest, we don't know what this week ahead will hold. For some of us, hard times will get harder. Maybe for some of us, we will experience relief. But would you be reminded in this blessing that regardless, there is a God who loves you, who longs to be intimate, in intimate relationship with you, and so goes with you wherever you go. Friends, may God go before you to lead you. Would God go behind you to protect you? May God go beneath you to sustain you. And may God go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. But may the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit fall upon you. Do not be afraid. 
but go to love and serve the Lord. Amen.